And now it's time for everybody's favorite color science sitcom, Why the Heck Do I Need All That Spectral Data? Tonight's episode stars Jackson McCaskey as that crazy grad student, Jack. And features John the math guy as John the professor guy. Tonight's episode starts with John the professor guy in his office when Jack enters. Hey Jack, how you doing? Hey professor, I just had a question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. What's up? Well, it's just, we're learning all about C-Lab, about yeah. how customers mm -hmm. request colors and they use C-Lab. We have to measure C-Lab values, and we have C-Lab compliance, and C-Lab this and that, and I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so you don't, you don't like C-Lab, is that it? Well, I guess I just want to know why we even need spectral values. Yeah, as opposed to just using C-Lab, you mean? Right. Oh, yeah, okay. So, you remember we talked about D50 lighting? Yeah, what is that, like, standard? Yeah, it's our standard in the print industry. It's lighting that is pretty much flat. There's the same amount of red, green, and blue light, kind of. You, you remember that, right? Right. Is it like daylight? Yeah, it's a lot like daylight. Do you remember any of the other luminance we talked about? Yeah, like uh, incandescent? Yeah, that's another one. And uh, is there another kind of lighting that's used all over the place now? Uh, fluorescent? Oh, yeah, yeah. But you know, I just went to Home Depot and I measured the light there. It's a LEDs. Okay. Yeah, so I think what I've seen so far is most of the stores have LED lighting and not our standard D50. Well, won't that throw everything off? Yeah, it can. And that's, that's part of why we need that spectral data. Okay, I guess it's starting to make sense now. Yeah, um, let me show you something here. Sure, Professor. I just, I just happen to have, yeah, Jack, I just happen to have brought some toys with me. Uh, let's see here. Let's go with a different set of sunglasses. Look at these toys. Aren't uh, those neat? Yeah, pick out, a, pick out a red set of them here. Oh, you look awesome. You look weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take them off for just a moment and see. Verify. Those are the, the Pantone base colors, right? Uh, looks that way, yeah. Yeah, okay, so uh, put the glasses on and tell me what you see. Glasses on? Um, I don't really see anything. What happened? So what does this look like, the yellow one? It looks like the color of the paper. It looks like there's nothing printed. Oh, how about any of these, the, these orange ones? They're disappearing. These ones are kind of showing up, but everything towards this end is kind of just white. Yeah, what do you see over here now? Uh, just the opposite. These ones all look black. Huh. I wonder why that is. Here we have the spectra of the four process inks. We've got cyan, we've got magenta, we've got yellow, and down here we've got black. Let's just say that I put on a pair of funky red sunglasses. I'm only going to see the red part of the spectrum because that's all the sunglasses will allow through. Or I could do this with a, a red light. So I'm looking at these four process colors under red LED light. You'll see that the yellow and the magenta inks are both pretty high reflectance. Both of them are going to look pretty much like white. The cyan and the black ink are both going to look very dark because there's very little reflectance for cyan or black in that region. Both of them will look black. What's next? How about I put on a pair of blue sunglasses, like this. Now I'm only looking at the blue part of the spectrum. I could do that, of course, with a blue LED, some kind of blue lighting. Here we see that cyan has a fairly high reflectance, so that's going to look kind of like white. Magenta is not quite as light as that. It's still above 20%, so it's maybe a gray. Yellow and black, on the other hand, both of them look like they're black. Imagine that. Yellow looks like black. And finally, I get out my green sunglasses or I turn on the green lights. Yellow looks like white. Cyan, kind of a gray. Magenta definitely looks black. And black looks like black. The colors all change in weird ways when I start putting filters in, when I change the lighting. This is an extreme case. The same sort of thing happens 
when we are changing the illumination in more subtle ways, but not quite as dramatically. Let's look at some, uh, okay. <laughs> some of these transparency filters. This is a nice green. Now put that over your face and tell me what you see with those colors. <laughs> you look awesome. Awesome. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, all the red values are black. Huh. Interesting. So what does that tell you? Well, it looks like the green filter is blocking out the red light. That's right. It's just looking, just letting the green light through. And it changes your perception of the color, right? Yeah, it makes it look darker, black. Yeah. Uh, do you think maybe that would be the same as, uh, let's just say that the, uh, that the lighting was changed? Yeah. So if we look at that under green light, it's the same as if you put this in front of your face. It's just like the LED lights and lows. Yeah, yeah. They're omitting some part of the spectrum, and that changes our perception of the color. So that spectral data will allow us to figure out what the color change is going to be when we go to different lighting. This whole thing is about color constancy. Color constancy? Well, what's that all about? <laughs> well, if you're, uh, let's say, looking at a magazine, it, you s still, you know what magazines are. Yeah, your, yeah. Your grandparents had them, I think. Uh, if you're looking at a magazine and you're under one lighting inside the building, let's say, and then I know this is probably an unfamiliar concept, but let's just say that you went outside of the building. Okay. I know you've been in this building like 24-7 <laughs> since you started here, but let's say you were to go outside of the building and you were looking at that same magazine. Would the colors change? Hmm. I'm thinking maybe that you own one of these things. Uh, a cell phone? Let's see. Yep, I got one right here. Awesome. I kind of figured you might have one there. Did you ever take a movie and go outside or change the lighting environment when you're watching the movie? Yeah. What happens? The phone adjusts the brightness and... Yeah. And you see what happens when you go from a dark area to uh, moving over where you can see a window? It kind of flares up and then yeah. adjusts itself back. Exactly, exactly. The really weird thing is that the eyeball does the same thing. Here's our good friends, the C-Lab equations. Now, Jack, I'm sure you could type these into a spreadsheet with your eyes closed in a dead sleep uh, with one spectrophotometer tied behind your back. But I want to point out one little thing about it. Notice all of the X sub n, Y sub n, and Z sub n's that are there. In the equation, we divide through by those. The Y sub n, in this case, represents the amount of light coming to the middle wavelength cones, and the Y sub n represents the amount of light in those cones when we are looking at something that is pure white under the chosen illuminant. We divide by X sub n, Y sub n, and Z sub n. That does normalization against whatever illuminant we're using. Why would we do that? Well, that goes back to a paper from Elliot Adams in 1942 for a color space that was the precursor to C-Lab. And his reasoning was that if I normalize against those things, then it guarantees that if I'm looking at something that is pure white, 100% reflectance at all wavelengths, that I'm going to get an L star of 100, an A star of 0, and a B star of 0. That was his thought at the time. What he wasn't thinking about at the time was the idea that the eye has chromatic adaptation. Somehow, despite the fact that I'm under incandescent light or I'm outside under bright sunlight, an apple still looks like an apple. Well, this approximation here, this uh, normalization against the illuminant, is a crude approximation for what happens in the eye that does chromatic adaptation. That way you can tell when an apple is ripe, whether you're inside, outside, if it's dusk or it's midday. Very handy thing. Very handy. Yeah. And you need spectral data to be, to be able to figure out when and how that's going to happen. Okay. Have I ever talked about metamorism? Metamorism. Yeah. 
Mm. It's a it's a nice word. It's a nice word. I, like, let's say it. metamorphism. Metamorphism. Yeah, I, I think that's awesome. There is in this book here of generic uh, color patches. There's this one right here. So under this lighting, those two colors are going to look the same. But if we look at it under a different lighting, what wow. do you see? They look like two totally different shades. So what does that tell us? Well, depending on the tint of the light, I guess the same color could look different. Let's look at the actual spectra and see what they look like. We know that we can make gray by just making a half tone of black. But we also know that we can make gray, that same gray actually, by mixing uh, half tones of cyan, magenta, and yellow. This graph shows us the spectra that we get with those two shades of gray, which actually look the same under D50 lighting. Go figure. The wiggles in the CMY spectra you would think that those would make it look some weird color, but it all kind of balances out when you go against the spectral response of the human eye. But what if the lighting changes? What if we're not under D50 and we're under some illuminant that takes this section here around 500 nanometers and puts more light in that area? That's going to change the color. Under D50, the color of these two may be the same, but when we look at them under D65 or uh, one of the fluorescent illuminants or an LED illuminant, the colors may no longer match. We call that metamerism. And we wouldn't know about metamerism if we didn't look at the spectrum. Does that have an implication for us in printing? You tell me, Professor. <laughs> well, let's just say that... Uh, Company A, printer A, decided to print using the, this set of pigments. Okay. And let's just say that they, uh, that another printer decided to use this set of pigments. Okay. And this is on a package. And that package is going to sit sometimes on a store shelf under LED lighting. Maybe it would be under uh, outdoor lighting, the sun coming through the, the windows. Are they going to match? Uh, no. Depending on the lighting, they would Dep be different. Depending upon the lighting, yeah. So that's a problem for us in the industry because we don't... And let's just say, let's take that a step further. Let's just say that a third printer decided, rather than using those uh, mixed up inks that you pour in a bucket and, and mix the colors, let's just say they decided to use that... Uh, Expanded gamut. Do you remember that? Yeah, I think we talked about that in yeah, class. Yeah, how's that work? Well, extended gamut is just your CMYK values plus orange and green. And violet. And violet. Yeah, and how is that used? Well, it gives us a wider variety of colors when we're mixing. Mm -hmm. Let's just take a day in the life of a packaging printer. They have the four basic colors, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, that they're printing for the imagery on the package. And then they have the spot colors. You're familiar with those, right? right? The spot colors that came out of a certain book made by a certain company. And let's just say uh, a typical package would have images and then a bunch of spot colors. Most of the artwork, most of the stuff that was done in Photoshop is made with spot colors, specifically. You, did you know that? Yeah. We've designed some stuff. Okay, all right, so you've seen that. Um, the packaging printer that's, pack, that's printing those day in and day out, uh, they may have 12 jobs in a day, or maybe they're three jobs, whatever, depends on the size of the jobs. And in between those, they've got the CMYK, but then they have to change over for the next job. So these extra three colors will take away some of that time between changing colors. Yes, exactly, they can print 90, 95 percent of the colors that are asked for. Including they, spot colors? Including spot colors. They can print those spot colors, most of them, with expanded gamut. Cyan, magenta, yellow, orange, green, and violet. And that means... Saving money. Why? Because the changeover costs money. Exactly. 
because of that, we're seeing that a lot of packaging is being done now with expanded gamut rather than specific spot colors. Now, think about that in terms of the stuff that's existing on the shelf that was printed with a spot color that came out of this book, mixing a bunch of inks. Now you're going to do it with cyan, magenta, orange, green, and violet, some combination of those. Is it going to have the same spectrum? No, I guess they'd probably be a little different. They'd probably be a little different. And what do you think is going to happen in the store? Well, depending on the lighting, like we've been talking about, it'll probably look a little different than it did. And how do we figure out if they look different? Spectral data. Yes! And that's why it's so important. Wow. Thanks for clearing that up, Professor. Sure.